Welcome to Galactic Terrors for February 2021, the online reading session uh, sponsored by the HWA's New York chapter. I'm Jim Chambers. And I'm Carol Geisander. So welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to see you. I am wearing bright orange in hopes that we can uh, acknowledge that it's uh, Valentine's Day coming up. So. Yes, it's uh, in, right around the corner, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I forget about Valentine's Day more and more the older I get. <laughs> but that's, that's okay. Funny. There's plenty, plenty of people in my life to remind me. Um, yes. Well, you but, know, I, I have an official opinion about birthdays as well. There's no reason that anybody should ever forget my birthday because I feel it's up to me to make sure they remember it. So, right? <laughs> that's a good strategy. Yeah. I'll make sure to uh, mark it on my calendar next time you remind me. <laughs> well, good. anyway, welcome to Galactic Terrors. Um, for those of you joining us for the first time, welcome. We're, we're glad to have you. For those who are coming back uh, from past sessions, we're glad to see you again, and we hope that you're enjoying the program and the series. Uh, Galactic Terrors presents readings of horror fiction and horror genre blends each month, and we try to bring you uh, a variety of authors and a variety of stories. And uh, thanks to the miracle of technology, we've been able to bring readers in from literally all around the world uh, in our six months on the air, so to speak. And it's been fantastic. Um, this is a program that is uh, sponsored by the Horror Writers Association New York chapter. Uh, and the HWA is an international author uh, networking and support group for people who write horror fiction. No surprise. <laughs> uh, we also sponsor, uh, well, I'll put on StokerCon once a year and administer the Bram Stoker Awards. And you can find out more about the Horror Writers Association at horror.org. And you can find out more about the HWANY at hwany.org. Uh, you can also look for us on Facebook and we'd be happy to hear from everybody. Um, we love feedback, and if you're a horror writer and you're in the New York area, please reach out. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. I, I've really been pleased. Uh, the three years I've been active at the group, I've found some of the most friendly, supportive, helpful, you know, knowledgeable people in, in the chapter and in HWA in, in general. And it's really been a great support for me and sort of pushed me to get more writing done. So, you know, I, I love the organization. It's very cool. That's it. We're really good at guilting each other into uh, <laughs> sitting down yeah. and being productive and writing. But Jim, uh, about that story. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. one thing uh, I should note, uh, recently we've had a change in the chapter. Uh, I have been coordinating the chapter for many years, and Carol Geisander has recently uh, agreed to be the co-coordinator. And Carol has been doing a tremendous amount of work to support the chapter and help us organize events, and especially to get things like Galactic Terrors up and running. Um, and she's not never afraid to jump in and... Uh, try something new. So we're really excited in the chapter and I'm really excited um, personally to have Carol join us as a co-coordinator. Well, thank you very much. And I was actually quite honored and, and stunned to be asked. So I, I'm happy to help and serve. And you do so much for HWA in our chapter that anything I can do to help is, is a, you know, happy to do. So thanks. Well, thank you. Yeah. So a um, couple of things before we jump into the uh, the items on the agenda, so to speak. Uh, one, I want to give a big shout out to Lou Rera. Lou uh, produces the graphics that open and close our program and introduce each author. And Lou is an incredibly dedicated and talented guy. And he came through for us this month producing these graphics while he was very much under the weather. So Lou, uh, I don't know if you're listening tonight or if you get a chance to watch us on a recording, but thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And you're the best. Yeah, gorgeous stuff. You make us look really good, dude. <laughs> so. Yes. <laughs> um, and the other thing, I just want to give a quick nod to uh, the KGB bar in New York. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. Uh, for the last three years, we have done uh, the chapters Women in Horror Month readings at the KGB bar. Mm -hmm. And we've been really thrilled to uh, be in that venue, which is a wonderful uh, place for readings and has a strong literary history in New York and is also host to the long running and terrific, fantastic fiction reading series uh, curated mm -hmm. by Ellen Datlow and Matthew Kressel. And uh, we miss it. We're, we're sorry we can't be there this year, um, this February, but we're excited that we can be online and have such a great lineup for you. 
Uh, Carol, would you like to say a bit about women in horror? Yeah, this is a special episode that we're doing uh, to celebrate women in horror and the works that they produce. Uh, you know, if, if you stop and think about it, um, somebody says, oh, yeah, a, a woman in, in the horror industry. Many people are going to think of the damsel in the ripped nightgown running through the rain from the guy with the chainsaw. Right. That's the first thing that comes to many people's mind when they think of women in horror. But women do so much. You know, they're on the screen. They're behind the screen. They're writing the script. They're working the cameras. They're writing novels. They're writing short stories. They're producing. They're publishing. They're doing so many things. And I have loved the idea of Women in Horror Month. Uh, this is actually the 12th year that it's been going on. And uh, it, it's it's really kind of a cool thing because it's not just a, a, a random idea. But it's it's a grassroots initiative where people got together and encouraged supporters to learn about and showcase all those underrepresented folks that are in the industries. Um, and I, I think it's terrific. We have always focused, since we're HWA Horror Writers Association, we focus on the, the writing aspect of it the most. Uh, uh, we've done readings at, at KGB, as Jim says, and our, our four readers tonight are, are folks who identify as female and, you know, have been doing wonderful readings uh, and, and writing and such like that. So um, there's something else that's very interesting about Women in Horror Month, though. Um, there's been a discussion within that community. I'm not a, a major uh, role player in the community, but I listen. And there's been a discussion about the fact that Women in Horror Month has been February, which is the same month as Black History Month. And uh, people were sort of thinking, you know, we, we don't really need to be putting one against the other, let's see what can do. So some discussion led people to think, well, maybe we should do it another month or, or whatever. But the, the Women in Horror Month organization has actually come out with an announcement that this has been going so well, we don't have to just stop at one month. They're encouraging us in the future, in, in 2022, to do whatever suits us for promoting women in horror. And we could pick a month of our own. We could uh, do it all year round. You know, we don't want to ignore men in horror either, but, you know, they feel like there's enough content out there to support the idea of, of promoting women in horror all year round. So that's going to be really interesting to see how that goes going forward. But, you know, we already had this in the works before that announcement came out, and I'm really delighted to, um, to have our readers with us tonight. Um, the other cool thing is that there are quite a few activities that are going on through HWA and through our, our chapter and with some of our readers going forward. Um, and we found a couple of those to spotlight as well. Um, tomorrow night, we've got HWA is doing a female of fright panel uh, and such, and that's February 12th. And um, that's pretty cool. Um, that's gonna be free. You could, there's a link that we'll be able to drop in the chat in a little bit of how you can sign up for that one. Uh, and that's got some really cool people coming up. Um, HWA has a skeleton hour, which is gonna focus on Sycorax's Daughters Anthology. That's a really cool book. That's a collection of dark fiction and poetry by black women writers. And that's gonna, uh, the panelists will include L.H. Moore, Linda Addison, Tish Jackson, Nicole Gibbons kurtz who's reading with us tonight, Rhonda J. Garcia and Elmarie Wood. And that's on Thursday, February 16th at 7 p.m. Um, and then uh, coming up a little later in the month on the 25th, that's uh, two weeks from tonight, the Syosset Public Library is out in Long Island, New York, and they are sponsoring with us, with the HW New York, another reading. So Megan R. Curry, uh, who's reading with us tonight, April Gray, Myself and our special guest is HWA Lifetime Achievement Award recipient Linda Addison. The four of us will be reading and doing some chatting and you know uh, some really cool stuff as well. So we'll we'll put some more of these links in the chat a little bit. And one more I want to tell you about because heaven forbid I know you're writing all these down, right? Um, we got the second panel of HWA's Female of Fright, Females of Fright. That's coming up on Friday the twenty sixth. And that also includes Nicole Givens for it's again. So great. That's, That's cool. awesome. And, and so Carol, because no, none of these programs can go forward perfectly. I showed the, uh, the second Females of Fright reading graphic while you were talking about the first session. So I'm just going to make up for that now and show the graphic for the, the session yep. on the 12th. That's one for the 12th. <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. So and lots of great stuff going on for horror, women in horror month. 
And uh, I think a lot of these things are planned far out in advance and, and they all kind of come together nicely. Um, and you guys in the audience are probably uh, wondering right about now when we're going to actually start these readings. Uh, I'm thinking Jim and Carol have probably said enough. So shall we just jump into our first reader? That sounds great. Excellent. All right. So joining us uh, tonight is Megan Arcuri. Megan writes fiction. Her stories can be found in various anthologies, including Borderland 7, Madhouse, Chiral Mad, and Chiral Mad 3. She is currently the vice president of the Horror Writers Association. She lives with her family in New York's Hudson Valley. Please visit her at meganarcuri.com, uh, or you can find her on Facebook and Twitter. All right. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Jim, and thank you, Carol. Um, thanks, HWA New York, for having me. And thanks, Lou, for that super creepy intro. Um, I'm Megan Arcuri, and I am going to be reading um, part of a short story. Um, it's called Am I Missing the Sunlight? And it's found in Borderlands 7. Um, it's also on the preliminary ballot for the Bram Stoker Awards, um, which is kind of exciting. But let me just get started. Am I Missing the Sunlight? You kiss the top of her sweet head, her hair wet from a bath. You towel her off and comb her hair out, starting at the bottom to minimize pain from knots. She watches herself in the mirror and sings some nonsensical song. You place your hand where her left shoulder meets her neck. You feel a lump. You press on it. What the hell is that? How long has it been there? Is it big for a lump like this? Are you a shitty mother for not noticing it sooner? Stop it, mommy. She jerks her shoulder away from you, an annoyed expression on her face. Sorry, sweetie, you say, as you resume combing her hair. But you can't help yourself. You touch the lump again. Wait, lumps. Holy hell, two lumps? No, three. Mommy, I just need to feel something, sweetie. She tries to move away from you again. Stay still. Echoes of hysteria reach your tone. She stills. What is it, mommy? You plaster a smile on your face as she looks at you in the mirror. You even out your tone. I'm not sure. You push on the lump again. Does this hurt? No. Good. Am I going to have to go to the doctor? You think yes, but you say maybe. Worry crosses over her face. Will I need a shot? You think maybe, but you say probably not. She smiles her new jack-o'-lantern smile. She lost her first tooth two nights ago. She goes back to humming her tune. You finish combing her hair, tuck her in and call your husband. Why does this stuff always seem to happen when he's away? You tell him about her neck, about the lump, no lumps. He tries to comfort, to sound calm and strong, but you know him too well to miss the anxiety in his tone. Hold on a minute, he says. A clicking sound comes through the phone. He's typing on his laptop. WebMD says it's probably the lymph nodes. He goes on to say something about swelling and infections, but all you think about is lumps. I can hear you, he says. Hear me what? I didn't say anything. I can hear you worrying. Do you have some sort of new superpower now? I've always had superpowers, baby. You laugh. There it is, he says. You shake your head jackass. But you're not worrying, are you? I'm always worrying. I know. You think I should call the doc? I think she's fine, but going to the doctor's a good idea, just to double check. I'll call tomorrow morning. Thanks. Love you. Love you too. You hang up and your next thought is not about lumps or the doctor or your daughter. It's about that guy, the homeless guy, the same homeless guy who waits by the traffic light where you put out where you pull out of the doctor's office. He's there so often you've come to associate him with the place. You sigh, you hate that he makes you uncomfortable. He didn't choose to be homeless, 
but you can't deny the emotion. He's clean cut and young, holding a backpack and a cardboard sign with words scrawled in black Sharpie. And it's the same sign every time. Every choice you make can help or hurt. Please help, God bless. This brings you back to your daughter, to the potential hurt she could face, that the family could face. What choice led you to that? You don't sleep well that night, spending most of it worrying, crying, peeking at the internet. Sure, your husband already did it, but you need to see for yourself. And he was right. Even the bloggy anecdotal stuff says the same thing. The vast majority of lumps on a six-year-old's neck are usually benign. Benign. Although not as scary as the word malignant, the word benign still makes you think of the C word. You chide yourself for thinking C word, and you let your internal voice whisper, cancer. Wasn't there some Neil Simon play where someone whispers cancer in a thick Brooklyn accent? You give it a try on your own. Cancer. Why the hell can't you remember the name of that play? Do you have early onset Alzheimer's or are you just weak minded? You would continue to beat yourself up with the picture on your computer's wallpaper of you and your husband squeezing her at her fifth birthday party makes you stop. Her face full of pure joy is there some way to bottle that and save it for later? For those moments when she's feeling the hurt and ache life invariably brings? Her face, so soft, so sweet. You've fallen hard for this child and you've fallen deep. Your stomach drops, you gasp for air, a loud sob leaves your lips. You hate crying, but you let the tears come. You swim in the pain the very thought of losing her gives you. You don't think about the heavy stuff during your day to day, more wrapped up in getting her to school on time or making sure she eats protein. But the lumps make you think about these things. They force you to. What if the internet is wrong? What if she's one of the minority? And now you're thinking of a world without her in it and what the ever loving hell is that all about? To be honest, you weren't sure about the whole kid thing when she was born. Babies are terribly needy and toddlers, God damn. They're like the Tasmanian devil, Mussolini, and Big Bird all wrapped up into one adorable little package. But now that she's been around for six years, you've grown pretty attached to her. She's becoming a person, a person you genuinely like hanging out with. And that face, it makes your heart melt. You've always thought of people who say that as schmaltzy, but now that she's in your life, you know what they mean. Your chest warms every time you see her, whether she's sad or pensive or happy. She wears the exact same face as your husband. Everyone says it, including you, as much as you secretly want her to look like you. But he's always said she has your smile, and he'd know since he makes you smile all the time. You wish he, he were here to make you smile right now. You check in at the doctor's office the next afternoon and sit in the waiting room. As usual, the TV is on, and as usual, she can't take her eyes off it. Doesn't matter what's on. If it's a screen, she's drawn to it. How did that happen? Did you let her watch too much TV when she was smaller? The American Academy of Pediatrics says no more than two hours of TV a day for kids under 12, but you swear to all that's good and holy that none of those people was ever a stay-at-home parent. They never had to deal with the 13 plus hours a day of trying to entertain a toddler who won't sit still for longer than five minutes unless you decide to check your email or take a phone call. Then they'll sit at your feet, calling your name for as long as they can. Two hours of TV. Very cute pediatricians. Not that you'll let her watch much more than that anyway. But judging by the way she craves the screen, maybe you've ruined her. Maybe she'll grow to be some sort of lazy slacker who hates reading and plays video games in, in your basement for the rest of her life. The rest of her life. That glimpse into the future reminds you that she might not be in it. She has lumps after all. The swiftness with which the sob rises from your throat surprises you and doesn't surprise you at all. You cough to suppress it. She giggles at something on the TV, that cute, sweet giggle only six-year-olds can make. Another sob forms, but the nurse comes in and you swallow it. Crying, is not, crying in front of other people is not your thing. She leads the two of you to the exam room and takes your daughter's vitals. You explain why you're here. She makes some notes and exits the room. Your daughter sits on the table, swinging her little legs and humming. How much longer, mommy? Could be five minutes, could be 50. Based on why you're here with a little Murphy's Law mixed in, it'll be closer to 50. 
Why does time slow when life gets scary? Soon, baby, you say. After seven minutes pass, someone knocks on the door. Without waiting for an answer, why do they even bother them? The doctor walks in, a bright smile on her face. You exchange a few pleasantries, then you tell her about the lumps, proud of yourself for not letting your voice waver. She listens and nods, face serious. Oh God, it's the C word. Brighton Beach Memoirs. There it is, the Neil Simon play. At least you don't have Alzheimer's for now. And I'm gonna stop there because I don't wanna take up too much more of my time, but thank you for, for staying with us. Megan, that's so awesome to hear you read this. Um, I, I read the story before and loved it, and it's just terrific hearing in your words as well, which is, is really fun. I feel like you have a really amazing ability to take everyday common little things and you know look at them with a certain little and make them really terrifying. So, you know, that's very, very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know very many people who can rock a second person uh, kind of story either, uh, you know, without. Oh, yeah, it was the first time I tried it. I hadn't, um, I, I always I always read them and I wanted to try it. And I was like, let me just, you know, see what this sounds like. So that's that's what came out. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, uh, we, we have a question that, that makes me wonder too. Amy asked us in the chat, what scares you? Oh, I mean, what doesn't scare me? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> um, I mean, really, you know, health things, I mean, which kind of just obviously touched, gets touched on in the story, um, you know, getting, you know, a real bad sickness, um, things like, you know, Alzheimer's and things like that, I find very very disquieting. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, th th that's, that's what comes to mind. Like, you know, or, you know, and losing, losing people that I love to those things or really to anything, but yeah. I understand. Yeah, that's true. I, and, and those are things that we can't control. And I think sometimes that's why. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's out of your hands. Exactly. Yeah. Well, there was an interesting observation just in passing from Ravatone who said it's interesting juxtaposition of this story with the children's books on the shelf behind you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, there's a little inspiration. Yeah, for yeah. Coming from, from, from my life, yeah, for sure. That's a little creepy, yeah. Well, we have we have two questions from, from Brian Matthews, which is really kind of a, a double benefit. He wanted to know if Sunshine was a Borderlines boot camp story. That's the first, first question. Oh, actually, no, it, it was oh. not. No, nope. okay. Nope. Can, uh, can you say just briefly what Borderlands Boot Camp is? Borderlands Boot Camp is a writer's workshop. It is, um, I love the tale. It is, um, it's a three day workshop. It's super intense. That's why it's called Boot Camp. It's run by um, Tom Monteleone, um, who runs uh, Borderlands Press. And um, usually F. Paul Wilson and Doug Winter and Ginger Buchanan are the other instructors. And what you do is um, everybody submits their work. And some people, it's like three chapters of a novel. Others, it's a short story. You submit it a bunch of months ahead of time. Everybody gets a copy of everybody else's stuff. And you do line edits and you, you know, read and make sure you have things to say about everybody's things so that when you get there on Friday, they, they give a lecture that night, kind of tell you what it's all about and how they're gonna help you, you know, learn how to better write. And then Saturday, you're in rooms all day with everybody in small groups just working on your, your own particular stories and getting really great, intense feedback. And it, it's one of those things, it's kind of, it's scary because you're putting yourself out there and um, people are, people are, you know, very honest with it. You know, they're, it's not your mom reading the story. It's people telling you, oh no, that works, that doesn't work. And here's why it doesn't work. But it's super helpful. And it really, um, you know, I've been a bunch of times, it's made me a, so much of a better writer. And um, really uh, Tom, Paul, Doug and Ginger are, I mean, they're, their breadth of knowledge and depth of knowledge is just, it's amazing what they know and what you can learn from them. So, and I've met a lot of really great people through it too. So it's been a great program. Well, cool. Cool. Yeah. And I don't want to forget the second half of his question, which is also uh, really uh, perfect because this, this is one of the stories that's on the Stoker Awards preliminary list. Is this your first time on the list? This is my first time on the list. So I was, I was surprised. Thank you. Yeah, it was definitely surprising. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's very cool. 
Cool. Well, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to ask you to come back a little bit at the end and we can all talk about what we have coming up. But thank you for sharing your story and telling us a little about this. This is very cool. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. I appreciate it. So I am pleased that I get to now introduce Nicole Gibbons Kurtz. Nicole is an author, editor, and educator. She's the recipient of the Horror Writers Association Diversity Grant for 2020. She's been named as one of Book Riot's best Black indie uh, SFF writers. She's also the editor of the groundbreaking anthology Slay, Stories of Vampire Noir. Her novels have been a finalist in the Dream Realm Awards, Fresh Voices, and Epi Awards for Science Fiction. She's written for White Wolf, Bram Stoker finalist in horror anthology with Sycorax's Daughters, and Serial Box's The Vela Salvation series. Nicole has over 40 short stories published as well as 11 novels and three active speculative mystery series. She's a member of the Horror Writers Association, Sisters in Crime and Science Fiction Writers of America. You can support her work via Patreon and you can find out more about her at her website, NicoleGibbonsKurtz.net. Thank you, I'm looking forward to hearing Nicole. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Jim, for having me tonight. Uh, thank you to Horror Writers Association New York chapter for having me as well. Today, oh, this evening, actually, I'm going to talk and read from my short story, Belly Speaker. It is a part of my Sisters of the Wild Sage uh, Weird Western collection. <clears throat> it takes place in the New Mexico Territory in 1901. And just to give a little bit of background, um, I spent six years in Gallup, New Mexico, um, teaching. And so I have spent a lot of time in the northwest corner um, of the state, um, are with surrounded on three sides by uh, the Navajo Nation, uh, Zuni, and Hopi tribes. All right, so I'm going to read from Belly Speaker. Belly Speaker. The sharp New Mexican wind lodged grit in the corners of her mouth. Honeysuckle wiped her lips with the back of her sleeve and spat on the dirt just outside the town of Wild Sage. Morning broke the horizon, and she squinted against the shimmering light. All around, the desert landscape changed like so many towns before, with tall poles and colorful canopies, exotic wildlife, and strange odors. Tucked into the crook of Honey's arm, Mama Wynn, watched with unblinking eyes as the rainbow of tents sprouted up against the flush sky. Early morning laborers, grunts and shouts, broke the new day's quiet. Fire snapped and crackled from makeshift pits. Smoke wafted across the fields, snaking across the grounds, seeking freedom. Honey, get over here and lend a hand. You know Anna's with child. The carnival owner, Bob Mathers, gestured his meaty and chapped hands towards Anna, swollen and pink, who rubbed the smile of her back. But I'm practicing, Honeysuckle adjusted Mama Lynn against her knee and then gestured with her head to the doll. Practicing what? How hard is it to make that stupid log of wood talk? Get over here, Bob barked. Don't you go over to him. Bloated pale pig, Mama Lynn's hoarse voice held hints of anger. You say something? Bob crossed his arms across his round belly and glared. Eh? Nothing. Honeysuckle squinted at Mama Lynn and met her glass glare. In a whisper, she added, Shush you, he the boss, we the workers. You the slave, and he the master. We ain't slave no more. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln, God rest his soul. We found freedom doing this work. Now come on, no rock in the boat. Honeysuckle sighed and sat Mama Lynn down beside her chair before heading over to the carnival owner. People crawled around, some she knew, some she didn't. Honeysuckle found comfort in strangers. Her dark robe brushed the tops of her boots as she walked. Her steps fell in a hush across the desert floor, but shot little dusty clouds in her wake. Even once she reached Big Bob, she could hear Mama Wins whispering in her mind, don't listen to him, don't listen to him, devils, demons. 
You walk so slow, lazy ass, Bob grunted and started toward the big tent. Hercules could use help with the cages. Honeysuckle let it go, as her people had practiced doing for decades, letting the rancid bark of those supposedly superior flow from their scarred and marred backs. Holding her head high, she reached Hercules. Big man. <coughs> he rumbled in greeting as he stood tall against the rising sun. Already drenched with sweat, he pushed a punishing hand through his shoulder-length hair. A mountain of a man, Hercules hadn't been his real name. After the war, everyone became someone else, even the nobodies. Carnival work gave them labels, allowed them to become strong men, funny men, belly speakers. I told you not to call me that, Honeysuckle reached down for the sledgehammer. My mama was killed by witchcraft. Ah, Hercules had a sheen of ancient sweat dripping down his forehead. A hulking dark figure, he reached out for the sledgehammer. Callous rough hands waved toward, toward her, waved her toward him. Gimme, witch. He smirked outright, fleshing, a fleshing out a dimple. If he hadn't been so cruel, he might have been handsome. A cold chill filtered up from her belly, gushing like a geyser inside her. Fact. She swung the heavy sledgehammer with ease, as if she had an extra set of hands. Honeysuckle watched the scarlet wound blossom across Hercules' upper chest, at the base of his throat, where their hammer's chipped edge snared his tanned flesh. The rest thing inked its way through his thick fingers, clawing at his throat, dark eyes bulging as he fought to breathe. Round, unblinking eyes took it all in. You don't hear too good, do you? The sledgehammer smacked the dirt as it slid from Honeysuckle's grasp. The icy burn began to recede, and as it did, she came back to herself. Her limbs tingled with pinpricks as if she'd been out in the cold too long. At once, Bob's shouting and Hercules' wheezing screams rent the dry air, and the thundering of running feet joined. What the hell you doing? Bob shoved Honeysuckle aside. Here, here, Anna, get the dock. Honeysuckle's belly balled into a knot of gnawing fear. What happened? She stumbled forward, tripping over the hammer's handle, handle but catching herself before she hit the ground. Bob snatched himself around to her, red face and spitting, fat bushy eyebrows crouched down in fury over angry, beady eyes. You ain't right in the head. Get out of my sight. Where the hell's the dock? Herc's turning blue. Honeysuckle pushed through the thin crowd and marched back to her trailer, scooped up Mama Lynn and retreated to its comforts. Inside, the oily smell of kerosene overpowered the scents of old tombs and the passage of time. The lantern's soft glow cast shadows into heavy curtains and worn leather-bound books. She plopped down on the edge of her bed and grabbed a bottle of whiskey from the floor beside. As she fingered the capped mouth, the amber liquid sloshed about half empty, just like Honeysuckle. What happened? Honeysuckle whirled around to Mama Lynn sitting on the love seat. The miniature doll with his hand-painted clothing, shoes, and facial features shook and began to grow. The wood rings pulsated in hypnotic fashion. Her soulless eyes widened as she did, <clears throat> as she did, Long wooden legs stretched out until the four-toed feet touched the throw rug. Lanky, thin, branch-like arms creaked as she reached out with four-fingered hands. The oblong head swelled till it's reaching the ceiling. Leafy branches sprouted around her head to create a verdant hair. Her lipless mouth opened and Mama Wind spoke. Nothing. Nothing? He could die. If Hercules die, I'm gonna be headed for the noose and you to the fire. Squashing a bug, ridden the area of pest, nothing more. The gravelly voice clashed with Mama Wynn's faux cheery face. Somehow, it made her words more sinister. Honeysuckle swallowed to ease her dry throat before trying again. There's a big difference between bugs and people. Mama Wynn's shimmering laughter shook her leaves, making them rustle in the small space, forcing the shadows to flicker. 
It raised goose flesh along Honeysuckle's arms and tightened that knot in her belly. Ever since she could remember, she'd had Mama win. The wooden doll had spoken to her when she'd been old enough to fetch water from the well back in Tennessee. But she never had been in such a predicament as this. With mounting fear, Honeysuckle gaped at Mama Wynn, reclining on the love seat unabashed. The grinning mouth stretched to accommodate the now larger face mocked Honeysuckle's fury. At that moment, all Honeysuckle could do was wait. Mama, we can't just attack a white man, even all the way out here. There's going to be hell to pay, even if Hercules don't die. Ain't nobody going to call me out of my name. Not no more. He did. He was talking to me. Same as talking to me. But mama, hush now, child. And I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Nicole. That was wonderful. <laughs> so I, I was I was listening to that and it's, it's really engaging. And one of the things that occurred to me this is from your Weird Western collection. Yes. And it's strange because traditional Westerns these days seem less popular even than Weird Westerns. Weird Westerns seem to have kind of taken the place of traditional Westerns in a lot of ways. Or maybe it's just because I'm in the genre, you know, horror genre area, but I'm thinking even in film, there are a lot of supernatural or horror Westerns that have come out in the last 10 years and not a lot of regular straightforward Westerns. So right. what, what about that area or that part of the genre appealed to you that you wrote a whole collection? <laughs> so um, I, I fell in love with Westerns when I was a young girl because my mother loved them. Like she watched Bonanza and, you know, she watched everything that was, if it was a Western, she watched it. And so that meant I watched it too, right? This is a time where you have one television in the house and what's on is <laughs> for everyone. Um, probably telling my age here. But I also spent those six years in New Mexico and fell in love with the Southwest, like fell in love with my time there. I was brought back east kicking and screaming, actually. Um, <laughs> but I love being in the Southwest. I love the cultures there. I love the various peoples there. I love how... The area is just very different um, than I found in the many other places that I've lived. It is a, it is the land of enchantment. That's New Mexico's slogan, and that it very much is. And if you live there, you fall in love with it, and there's not anywhere else quite like it. And so I started writing uh, weird westerns when I lived in New Mexico, just a way to kind of encapsulate the the feelings I was having. You know, you're driving two hours to Albuquerque from from Gallup, and there's just open stretches of land and there is nothing out there and so you think man what would happen if right and they have such great names for towns like las cruces the cities of crosses or las lunas the city of moon so the city of moon werewolves of course so there's a story about <laughs> las lunas in right in, in, in the sisters of the wild stage so my love for westerners and then my deep love for new mexico and my experience there are the things that drove um sisters of the wild stage that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think for a lot of authors, we start with the fiction we see, whether that's in prose or on TV or in the movies or whatever, and it really gets its hooks into us when we we get to the real history or the real places. Do you find that that's what really speaks to you is the, is the history of, of New Mexico? And being able to tell those other stories because I grew up with yeah. like Clint Eastwood westerns and right, so you only saw white males in those roles and or white males painted as or portraying Native Americans. And so one of the things I wanted to do with my stories is tell the stories of the other people in the West, right? There's a whole history that kind of Hollywood kind of like sidetracked about the other, the Chinese immigrants who came with the railroad, you know, the the freed slaves or the slaves after during the reconstruction period who went West. So there's all these other people in the West um, who don't get their women, <laughs> right? <laughs> who husbands died on the way over and they find themselves <laughs> widowed, right? In this rough and tumble environment. So there's all these other stories that haven't been told, right? Um, and so I found myself wanting to tell stories about the other people in the West. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, history is always a lot richer than I think 
we've seen in you know mainstream media and so there's a lot of opportunities there to bring those stories forward absolutely that's awesome so we have a question from brian matthews and uh brian notes that you've written in many genres uh and do you have one that's your favorite that you prefer to write or do you really just like to mix them i like to mix them um my favorite of course is to mix up mysteries with other genres so i have a science fiction mystery series and then i have a a fantasy mystery series. So um, I like to, I like suspense, I like thrills, I like horror. And so they all tend to blend together. Um, I like blending a lot. So, which is probably why I don't stay in one lane. <laughs> right. <laughs> great. And, you know, I think one of the great things is that uh, readers and publishers seem a lot more receptive to that now than they did in the past. Yes. <laughs> where it was really it had to be very clearly in a certain genre. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question from Teresa Derwin. What is the first Weird West story? And I'm not sure uh, if Teresa means what is your first Weird West story <laughs> or what is what is the very first one? Um, um, there's some, so the first, well, I mean, if you go back to like old Jonah Hex comics, right? But it goes further back than that with some of the pulp titles from the, the, the 40s and the 50s um, that had Westerns that had some supernatural elements to them. And if you think about the Twilight Zone, um, there are a couple episodes there that Rod Sterling wrote or produced mm -hmm. where they're in the West and something strange and weird happens. So <laughs> you're looking at the 1940s and 50s, actually, for the very first Western story. Yeah, I think it does go back quite a ways, although mm -hmm. the Jonah Hex comics you mentioned were probably my introduction to the weird <laughs> Western. Yeah. <laughs> so, He's a uh, favorite of mine as well. They're great, yeah. And there's a, there's a great uh, Weird Western by Joe Lansdale called Dead in the West that I think was the second Weird West story I read. So, I mean, you may even go back further to Ambrose Bierce, um, mm. uh short stories as well. They were very much, some of them are very, um, have supernatural elements to them as well. And that's even further back. It's like in the 1800s. So. Yes. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, I bet, I bet there's, a, there's an article there if somebody wants to do the research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, uh, and we have a question from Carla. So you edited Slay. Uh, how was the role of an editor challenging and different than the role of a writer? So editing Slay was a fantastic experience. It is actually my first anthology that I edited. So that was a piece of work. Um, it was different in the sense that I had to be very conscious of paying attention to, to the story as opposed to getting lost in the details, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so when I'm writing a story, it's my story and I get to influence what they do. But when you're editing, it's not your story. And so you have to, what you're doing is giving constructive feedback. You gotta be careful not to erase voices, the voice of your author. You gotta be careful to like, make sure that you, uh, with their work, that you're not overwriting it or erasing it, right? And so that's probably the most challenging thing because if I don't like this paragraph, I can take it out. If I want to start this story over, I can do that as a writer. And so that's my flexibility. But when I'm editing, I have to remember that this is X author's story and I'm trying, in my attempt to make it better, not to make it mine. And so that was uh, a bit of a challenge for some stories. I'm like, oh, it'd be so great if we did this. And I was completely wrong because the story was fine the way it was. <laughs> so <laughs> it's just going to be make sure that I honor um, right. the the author's voice, which is really important when you're editing um, someone else's work. So you really have to wrap your head around another author's style, another author's voice, and kind of understand it from the inside out. Do you find that that helps you as a writer when you're doing your own work that you take away from what you've learned from other authors? Oh, absolutely. And yeah. I read Slush for Mocha Memoirs because that's my press. Um, and so I read other people's work a lot and have to decide what what works and what doesn't work, right? And so I do learn those lessons for myself as a writer, like what works and what doesn't work in terms of hooking an author, a reader, you know, all those things, right? Um, so yeah, I learned from slush reading, I learned from editing um, other people's work. Yes, those are all, I learned lots of lessons to improve my own craft and those by reading those things, sure. That's great. Yeah, I think we have uh, one more question and then we'll, <laughs> we'll get to the next reading, but this is from Rob Atone. And Rob is asking if you think there's a connection between the idea of westward expansion and the deepening of folklore. That's interesting. I do think um, initially in the in, when we were going west, um, and it was still a, a pretty much an uncharted and, and new 
area, I definitely think that folklore and how they were able to explain what they, the new things that the othering or the, the new things they were encountering mm -hmm. developed stories and that did enrich and deepen folklore, right? And I do think that there were times when they met with other peoples in the West and learned those stories about where, you know, where Buffalo come from or, um, and, and, and they took those things, right? As they were explained by native peoples and incorporated them into their own folklore. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I definitely think that was true. And I think that happened um, as we migrated West as, as a country um, and encountered new things. Interesting, great question, Rob, mm -hmm. thought provoking. <laughs> So, Nicole, thank you so much. Uh, thank we you. really enjoyed the reading, and we'll see you again at the end of the program. Yes, sir. All Thanks. Right. <laughs> okay, thank you, everybody. Our next reader is Nancy Lambert from New York City. As N.R. Lambert, her stories appear or are forthcoming in Vestarian, 99 Tiny Terrors, Pseudopod, Lovecraft Mythos, and Don't Turn Out the Lights. She's also written for Entertainment Weekly, Time, Life, and Tour.com. She was a 2019 U.S. National Park Service Artist in Residence at Fire Island National Seashore. In addition to her work as a pop culture author and freelance copywriter, she volunteers with Read Ahead and 826 NYC and teaches creative writing workshops for young writers at the Center for Fiction. Find her online at nrlambert.com. Hi, everyone. Um, Lou, I want to thank you for that opening trailer. It's amazing. And anyone who knows me knows I am obsessed with keyholes and doorknobs and old doors. So it was especially pertinent for me. Um, thank you, Jim and Carol and everyone at HWA New York for having me tonight. Um, and thank you to everyone watching at home um, or wherever. Uh, tonight I'm going to be reading uh, my story from uh, Don't Turn Out the Lights, which is published from HarperCollins and was presented uh, by the HWA and edited by Jonathan Bayberry. Uh, my story is called Tag Your It. On Friday morning, just before homeroom, a stranger called I Know You began tagging Nick Dale on Pixagram. The posts were all copycat pictures of Nick's most recent selfies, identical in setting, but in every one, Nick found himself replaced by a six foot tall baby doll wearing a soiled, tattered gown. A jagged fracture ran across the doll's oversized porcelain head, cutting diagonally over its right eye and chipping out part of the pupil. Stunned, Nick swiped through the posts. There was Nick's selfie from lunch the day before, except now the giant doll sat in Nick's spot at the table. In another, the doll, not Nick, stood at bat during yesterday's Little League practice. And in Nick's selfie from the bus ride home last night, the doll's shattered face, instead of his own, stared out the dust-streaked window. I know you tagged Nick in all of them. It had to be someone he knew from school, maybe a friend pranking him, or one of the ob obnoxious eighth graders on his team. Or was it just some random troll? Nick tapped I know you's profile picture and winced. A super close-up photo of a single eye, wide and bloodshot, pinhole pupil shrinking away from a too bright light. The bio read only, tag, you're it. What a total creeper. Nick's hands shook a little as he swiped through I know you's older posts. Whoever it was, copying people's pixes was their jam, and they did it a lot. The pattern seemed to go like this. I know you targeted a user and tagged them in a bunch of copycat pixels on a single day, recreating the user's latest photos with the freaky doll. I know you's targets lived all over the world, but they had one thing in common. Every one of them stopped posting once I know you began tagging them. To end each copycat series, I know you posted a single original photo, no doll, just a dark bedroom, lit with a gleaming blue-white flash. 
and a blurry figure in bed, posing as if they'd been surprised. Some reaching for phones, others lamps, some just recoiling, caught in the camera's flash as though they'd been snared in a trap. Even more bizarre, in each one, the person in bed resembled I know you's target du jour. The photos had to be staged, but still. What a weirdo. 100% block. Nick tapped to block I know you's account and closed the app. His phone remained quiet for the rest of the day. But as Nick walked up to his house late that afternoon, a new stream of notifications flooded in. I know you, tagged you on Pixagram. More copycat selfies from I know you, somehow slinking past Nick's block. This time, the human-sized doll clutched a Coke at the same deli where Nick bought a soda earlier that day. In another, its creepy cracked face bent over a math workbook at the same donut shop where Nick had been studying with his friends just an hour ago. In fact, Nick zoomed in. He was in the background of the picture, tossing a crumpled paper bag into the recycling bin and wearing the exact same clothes he wore at that very moment. Heart racing, Nick checked his earlier posts. He appeared in the background of every single one, walking, talking with friends, face bent over his phone, this creeper had been stalking him all day. A new notification buzzed. I know you, tagged you on Pixagram. The doll, standing at the top of Nick's street, dark against a streaky orange sunset, almost an exact replica of the Pixagram selfie Nick had taken moments earlier. He zoomed in and sure enough, he could just make himself out in the distance, paused at his front door, looking down at his phone. Nick whipped around and scanned the street. No one. Nothing but a few sprinklers spattering on lawns. He swiped through the pixels again, a cold knot tightening in his stomach. His every move over the last day or so, shadowed, copied, even mocked a little. How could he miss a giant creepy baby doll on a bus, at school, in the lunchroom? There was no way. These had to be photoshopped didn't they? Nick entered the house quickly, fighting the urge to look back over his shoulder and feeling like a total wuss for wishing his parents had got home earlier on weeknights. As soon as he locked the door behind him, Nick switched his pixogram to a private account and blocked I know you again. Already late to meet his friends at the movies, Nick showered quickly, keeping the curtain partially open while his phone chirped away on the sink. Still dripping, he braved a glance and huffed in relief. Just text from his friends, wondering when he'd be there. But while he tapped out replies, a new notification popped up. I know you, tagged you on Pixagram. Nick hesitated, then tapped. The giant baby doll stood at Nick's front door. Its crooked finger, an unnatural twist of rusted wire and broken porcelain hovered over the doorbell. The chill gripping Nick's stomach crawled up his spine and prickled across the back of his neck. He waited, breath held, but nothing happened. He crept over to the window and peeked out. The landing was empty, the street dark and quiet. But as he turned away from the sill, bing bong, Nick froze. Should he call the police, his parents? And what would he tell them? that he was being stalked by a doll, no one would believe him. He flicked on the stoop light and peeked out again, still empty. He checked the locks on every door and window in the house, his heart pounding each time he pushed aside a curtain, certain the doll's pale face would be pressed up against the glass. What would be worse? Staying home with I know you taunting him we're going to the movies, sitting in the pitch black and looking over his shoulder every 10 seconds. If anyone caught him melting down over a big baby doll, he'd never hear the end of it. Nick messaged his friends that he was staying in and reported I know you's account to Pixagram before blocking it yet again. How did this creep show keep slipping past his bands? His phone lit up with a few messages giving him a hard time about bailing, but nothing new from I know you. Still, 
Before he climbed the stairs to his bedroom, Nick pulled a bat out of his practice bag. But even with it leaning there against his nightstand, in easy reach of the bed, Nick struggled to close his eyes and fall asleep. I know you's final frozen bedroom shots flaring through his brain. But he must have dozed off eventually because Nick jolted awake when the phone started buzzing again and again and again. His whole body thumped with his startled heartbeat. I know you, tagged you on Pixagram. Nick didn't want to look, but he couldn't help it. And once he did, he couldn't look away. The doll's cracked face glancing over its shoulder as it opened Nick's front door. The doll's chipped eye reflected in the bathroom mirror, still steamy from Nick's shower. The doll's bent body on all fours climbing up the stairs. The doll's mangled hands pressing against Nick's bedroom door. And in the last post, the doll looming over Nick asleep in bed phone still clutched in his hand. Nick scrambled upright and turned on the lamp. His room was empty, his door still shut, his phone screen dark and blank. Nick opened Pixagram again. I know you's account was still blocked and no new tags since the photo at the doorbell hours ago. It must have been an awful dream. Nick glanced at the time. Somehow midnight had come and gone, and in just a few hours, his parents would be jostling him awake for breakfast. As he waited for his heart to slow, he deleted the Pixagram app, powered off his phone, and stuck it on the nightstand charger. He hesitated a moment longer before turning off the light and rolling over into his pillow. But just as Nick shut his eyes, the phone suddenly jumped and buzzed. I know you, tagged you on Pixagram. The floor creaked. Something wheezed and crinkled at the foot of his bed. Nick twisted toward the sound and flash. On the floor, Nick's phone buzzed one last time, unheard. I know you, tagged you on Pixagram. And that's the end. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Yow. Yeah. <laughs> That's like shades of I know what you did this summer, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, we were getting some fun comments in in the uh, uh, chat while you were reading, uh, okay. saying, you know, ah, the dark lure of social media. <laughs> and then uh, John says, delete that app, damn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think people really, really felt that one. You know, that was that was very cool. So um, we've got a great question though, yeah. uh, or two coming uh, from. Um, uh, I'm gonna put my glasses back on. Because... I'm gonna join you, Carol, because I use my reading glasses, and now I have my computer glasses. So you. Oh, are Nancy, here. hi, you're here. Hi, How are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. My Her eyes are here. Had had a, a a really cool question. He wanted to know: Is there a lot of pressure contributing to the collection, knowing that it's in the tradition of the iconic scary stories to tell in the dark? Um. Well. I entered uh, this collection through a, um, a competition. So oh. the pressure for me was um, to make the deadline, um, which is always a challenge. Yes. Um, but I, you know, like I wanted to really try to do a story that honored the original Scary Stories Tell in the Dark, which yeah. were so formative for me um, and still scare me, <laughs> um, especially yeah. these illustrations. Yeah. So I just tried to, you know, like I reread everything again and, um, I tried to find uh, something that was sort of current that felt scary to me, which is social media it terrifies me. So mm -hmm. um, I tried to bring that to the children and maybe give them a small warning about oversharing online. Yes, yes, I think that that really, really well done. You know, <laughs> I, I wish I could be a fly on the wall when a kid is reading this story and what, <laughs> what they're thinking and how often they look at their phone while they're reading it. You know, that that's pretty cool to think about. Yeah, but that's very cool. So uh, Allison had a question also. So we said a little bit, but what was your inspiration for this story? And was it something like you know what I saw last summer or or what? Um, really, the inspiration for this was the original scary stories to tell in the dark. I was looking at a lot of, um, cause they kind of, you know, like, I don't know if everyone has read them recently, but, um, they sort of range between like these 
sort of like very classic fairy tale folklore feeling stories. And then there were some other ones that had this, this sort of, um, you know, urban legend quality to them that felt a little bit more contemporary, like the one with the woman driving home and the person flashing the lights in the back of the car. And then there's somebody trying to kill her, you know, like, um, yeah, yeah. so I really, it really came from like that element of it. And, um, cool. keeping it scary for young people, I just, you yeah. know, they can take a lot in terms of, I think their imaginations are amazing. Um, so I basically just trying to leave enough space for them to imagine it as much as they're comfortable with and not to make it um, too visceral on the page when uh, that would be my advice for writing for yeah. a younger audience is to just leave some air for them because they have amazing imaginations. Okay, cool. And I was wondering when you do the creative writing workshops for, for young people, is it horror or is it any kind of writing? What do you, what do you cover in those workshops? Um, so I've done mostly horror. They've all been genre of some sort. Um, but uh, we did uh, the first three we did in October were all sort of like tangential to horror. And uh, there was a ghost stories one, we did monsters, and then we did like uh, scary technology, um, you know, robot revolution, that kind of thing. Yeah. And um, it it uh, they're fantastic. Those kids impress me every single time. The kids I work with at eight two six are the same. They're just um, I aspire to approach my writing with the same amount of enthusiasm and um, fearlessness that they do is um, something we can all learn from. I think uh, it's just you get to a certain age and it's sort of like, well, oh, the editor is going to hate this, <laughs> like. It's sort of uh, trying to recapture that spark is, um, it helps to work with the kids for that. I recommend yeah. it to everybody. And I, I think that's so key. You know, we all have to remember that. Don't prejudge. Yeah. You know, my my writer friends tell me the same thing. Don't let the, don't decide for the editor what they're gonna like or not. Yeah. So that's great to get in their heads now. Then, you know, maybe it would stick, yeah. Don't self-reject, all right? That's the one yes. that you see everywhere. Yeah. Yes. And you should, because, you know, uh, it really, I've had stories, um, I've sold stories that have been rejected 45 times. Like there's an editor out there for every story and vice versa, I think. So. Yes, and just because they reject the story doesn't mean it's a bad story. It just wasn't right for them at the time. Absolutely, so, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell myself that 47 times and I'll write it on the back. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Yeah. I'm not saying I, I took all them gracefully, but I mean, like it did eventually sell. So it's a happy yes. story. Yes. And one last question from, from Teal James Glenn, who wants to know who Hi, is yeah. who is the woman writer who inspired you? Oh, so probably earliest on would have been like Shirley Jackson or Lois Duncan. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. But now I'm just like, we have so many amazing um, just women in horror that like my TBR is forever growing <laughs> and will outlive me. <laughs> and yes. I only hope that there's an afterlife so I can keep reading. Yes, yes, my TBR pile could tip over and crush me and it's just to make people <laughs> on my phone. You know, so just picture, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm you. really excited that you came and read with us. And you know, one of the last things I just wanna say, Carla had a great comment. The creep is so palpable. I can see a young person really responding to the gradually worsening of the situation. Yeah, <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So thank, thank you, you, Nancy. Thanks, that, everyone. That's really exciting. Yeah. So I, um, I'm pleased I get to introduce Karen Warren now. Uh, Karen is a uh, Shirley Jackson Award winner. Karen Warren published her first short story in 1993 and has had fiction in print every year since. She was recently given the Peter McNamara Lifetime Achievement Award and was guest of honor at World Fantasy 2018, Stoker 2019, and Geyser Khan 2019. Karen was a fellow at the Museum for Australian Democracy, where she researched prime ministers, artists, and serial killers. She's judged the World Fantasy Awards and the Shirley Jackson Awards. She has published five multi-award winning novels, Slights, Walking the Tree, Mystification, The Grief Hole, and Tide of Stone, and seven short story collections, including the multi-award winning Through Splintered Walls. She has won the ACT Writers and Publishers Award four times and twice been awarded the Canberra Critics Circle Award for fiction. Her most recent novella, Into Bones Like Oil from Meerkat Press was shortlisted for a Shirley Jackson Award and the Bram Stoker Award, winning the Orealis <clears throat> Award. Karen Warren. Mm -hmm.
Everybody. Oh, thank you, Carol, for that introduction. It's so great to have heard those stories from those amazing women and to be a part of this. So I thought today I would read a short story from um, a book called Dark and Companions, which was a uh, testimony to uh, Ramsey Campbell and his work. And it is set in uh, Canberra, where I live. So I thought it might be uh, good to bring a bit of my home to you, even though um, we're a long way apart geographically. So it's called The Wither. During training, the instructors warned them about difficult passengers. Carl heard all that three times. That's how long it took him to pass. It meant all the more when he finally did get through. He'd really earned that accreditation. They practised loud passengers, drunk ones, armorous ones and abusive ones. He thought he'd be right. He had a nice face and plenty of muscles and people seemed to like him. They practised kicking people off the bus and learned where the emergency buttons were. They learnt about how to defuse a violent situation. But nothing prepared him for the wither. It was only his first week. He was loving wielding the bus, rolling it through the streets, taking people where they wanted to go, sitting up high, playing the music he wanted to listen to. Avoid profanity, they'd been told, and you wouldn't argue with that. Keeping tally of the thank yous and happy each day when they outnumbered the fuck yous. In his last job, it had been fuck you most of the day. That was security guard at the hospital, and he couldn't believe how many people came in there filled with hate. He'd quit the day he got vomited on by a teenage girl who then accused him of trying to grope her. Before that, he'd been a census taker and that wasn't nice. And before that, a night packer at a supermarket. No abuse there, but he didn't like the hours. So bus driving was a walk in the park or a drive around the park, more like. He was on Route 14, which went from the city to the National Library, the airport, the Defence Academy and back to the city in one 45-minute loop. So he got a lot of different passengers. He just nodded to three clean-shaven young men. One of them wouldn't look him in the eye, but who was he to judge? And it hit the door mechanism when one of the young men called out, hang on, one more. He glanced at his mirror and saw an elderly lady making her way. There's another bus 10 minutes behind me, he called out. But instead of lifting her arm in acknowledgement, she sped up slightly. He was 30 seconds ahead of schedule, so he waited for her. Wither, she said when, he, when she climbed up. Wither. City, library, airport, defence academy, he said. She nodded, waved a ticket at him. They were supposed to check them, but the trainer said, don't make a big deal of it. If they're that desperate, they need to cheat, leave them be. Unless they're behaving badly let him on. So he didn't check it. Her hands were quite delicate, the fingernails perfectly oval, painted coral pink. Just behind her was a guy with a limp, sweating, red. He thanked Carl profusely for waiting. I can't tell you how long it would have took me to walk, he said. Carl forgot about the woman as he drove. The route was quite busy and he was focused on staying on time. Early was worse than late. They'd get phone calls if he was early. So when she got on again, on his second loop of the day, it totally threw him. Wither, she said, and he told her again where he was going. No idea where she'd gotten off. She wasn't as old as he'd thought at first, but still there was no way she could have run ahead of him like that. He held the bus until she sat down. It was a hot day and the bus shimmered with it, so he turned up the cooling. He was busy for a while, but when it happened for a third time, he radioed the network. Mystery passenger, you guys having a go, right? Putting a hottie on the bus then drop before driving her to the next stop? You wouldn't know a hottie if she fell at your feet, Roger said. He was en route to City, Northside, Racing Park. He'd been a mentor to Carl. He'd be the one who'd set up any joke. The controller broke in. Keep it private, boys. I don't want to hear the sordid details and neither does anyone else. She was in her 30s, fake blonde, always ready with a quip. He'd been told she liked to have a few at the Christmas party and could be relied upon to dance around a pole if there was one. Last stop, Carl called over the intercom. He hated the sound of his own voice out loud. In his head, it was much deeper. Bus terminates here. The bus goes back to the depot from here. The old woman wouldn't get off the bus, blocking those behind her. 
wither, she said. Wither, 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 he said, frustrated with it. With who? A passenger asked him. With her. With her. She wanted him to go with her. She was an elegant woman, now he looked. Neat beige shoes with a low heel, stockings, a skirt that went to her calves and a well-ironed shirt. She wasn't dressed sexy, but still he thought she gave him a look. He hadn't had anyone look at him like that for a long time. Ever? There was Lynette. She'd loved him for a while and she seemed to find him attractive. That was a long time ago, though. He'd flirt with the female passengers, especially the old ones who didn't get much attention anymore. He didn't think he was kidding himself that they liked it, but none of them looked at him that way, the way this woman was looking at him now. She seemed to find the steps hard to manage, so he helped her down. With her, she whispered in his ear. I can't do that, sorry, he said. Which bus were you after? She looked at him expectantly, then took three steps forward and stopped, like a cat leading an owner to the food bowl. He wouldn't go with her. He wanted a quick shower, food, a sleep. You really had to concentrate driving these buses. He was tired, hungry. He wanted to sleep for a day. Exhaustion fell over him and he thought he could sleep standing there in the bus station. She took another few steps and stumbled. He took her arm and led her to a bench. You rest until you're right to head off, he said. He left her there, heading back to his bus. It wouldn't drive itself to the depot. He didn't see the wither for a couple of shifts. He'd dreamt about her, though, woken up kicking himself he hadn't followed. He lacked the adventurous spirit. Lynette used to say so, and maybe she was right. Then the wither showed up again, waiting at the library bus stop. She was beautiful, he noticed this time. Luminous skin, shiny hair. Just looking at her made his throat dry up. Wither, she said, with her. His eyes felt itchy, his skin dry. It happened again twice that shift, her on and off, on and off, and the last time he kept a good eye on her, but she disappeared up the back, out of his sight line. At the end of his shift, he waited till everyone got off the bus, then locked the door. He closed his eyes. Just a short rest. That's all he wanted. A moment. Then he'd walk up the aisle and find her. A tap on the door woke him, his supervisor. Come on, Carl, you can sleep when you're dead. He was almost at the depot in the 10 minute stretch of scrub and rock when he saw the wither. No bus stop, just his lady, her armour held out elegantly. He pulled in, opened the door, but she didn't climb the stairs. Instead, she walked three steps and looked back, doing her cat impersonation. This time he went with her. He couldn't remember later if he'd locked the bus. He had no keys anyway. His pockets were empty. With her, she said. He followed. She was quick. It looked as if she were floating. Her, his feet hurt because he wasn't used to walking and before long he was wet under the arms. He'd stink even if he did catch up with her. They walked a long way, through parking lots, over roads, suburban streets. They crossed over schools and playgrounds, past cafes and houses. She led him. He wanted to turn back, but where would he go? By now he was thoroughly lost and had no phone with him, no wallet. He'd had them, he was sure, but he didn't have them now. He stumbled and fell, and even lifting himself was an effort. He was so thirsty, he'd drink out of a muddy puddle if he found one. He tried to talk to her, but no response beyond a brightness in her eyes, a wetness, and she'd lick her lips as if they were dry, moistening them. I'm with her, he told himself. He pictured them out. She was so beautiful, people would look at them. He'd need new clothes to keep up with her. He'd need a haircut and a diet, but he could do it. He was good looking enough. His skin felt dry and he scratched. His throat was so dry he couldn't swallow. Even his sweat dried up. His eyes itched. At times she seemed to fade away and he wondered if he was dreaming at all, but she was there. He could hear her see her. She took his hand and her palm was so soft it was like holding a fistful of silk. She was real. They walked through puddles but they didn't stop to drink, through backyards and front yards, over bridges, through tunnels. 
His stomach felt concave. He hadn't been this hungry since school when there was something disgusting and he didn't get the next meal until he had finished the last. Or when his mother died and he couldn't eat. Or when he was drunk for three days and kept forgetting if he'd eaten or not. He couldn't remember if any of that was true. At last they came to a tall, abandoned building. Around it were building sites, empty shops, car parks with two or three burned cars in them. It was no place he'd ever been before, but it seemed strangely familiar. The metal door was half off its hinges. An official notice said, work on this site halted until further notice, and he wondered why. He wondered where he was. He felt for his phone and then remembered it was lost. Inside, the foyer had been partially completed. It was lavish with dark slate tiles, although there were many gaps and he thought perhaps those tiles had been stolen, and marble bench tops. Artwork was placed high on the walls, perhaps out of reach of looters. Someone had scrawled in letters as tall as Carl, with all great structure comes sacrifice. She let him past all this, past the lifts, past the fire doors, to a small white door named Air Shaft. He was transported then, confused. His old school had such a thing. He remembered it as if he had climbed into it yesterday. But he can't have walked that far, a state away, hundreds of kilometres. It would stand, he imagined, as it always did, with windows on the lower floors boarded up as usual. Those classrooms never saw natural light. The only natural light came from the air shaft. You could see the stars from a certain viewpoint in that air shaft. Each floor had an entry point and a small landing, big enough for a boy to squeeze himself into a ball and gaze at the stars. He was suddenly unsure how old he was. Was he 13, trying to hide from the class teacher who wanted an assignment in or else? Was he 14, snuggled away looking at the magazine he'd found? 15, wanting somewhere private to cry out his broken heart? The wither tugged at his hand. He wasn't 13, he was 38, arms hairy, some muscle. He was a grown man. It seemed she was naked now or wearing something filmy, see-through, no underwear. He hadn't yet spoken to her in all this time, terrified of his stupidity, would it scare her away, but now words gushed out. Soon he would wonder, how had he known this would be his last chance to speak. What's your name? Where are we? What are we doing here? What are you doing? Who are you? I love you. She pushed open the air shaft door. An almost refreshing wave of warm air billowed out, drying the last of the sweat on his face. On his face. His underwear had hitched up and he wanted to fix it, but was too embarrassed. Sunlight caught in from above. At night there would be stars. It was deathly quiet, deathly still. Hello, he called into the shaft. His own voice bounced back at him, whiny, nasal. At the bottom, he could see piles of things. Wallets, he thought, maybe a bag or two, books, phones. He smelt metal, heated, and dust. He looked up. He could see hanging things anchored to the wires along the way, the girders tied with chains or tangled up in other ways. Four, five, six, hanging down, looking like bodies, withered bodies. Wither, she said, and she laughed, the only other noise he'd heard out of her. He moved backwards, thinking she wanted to trap him, that he would swing and wither too, along with these others. Wither, she called into the shaft, and he could already feel the pull and tug as his skin began to shrivel. He tried to step back but found the way blocked by wires. Ducking underneath wasn't viable, so he tried to squeeze through them, got stuck, caught. There were loose wires, cables, one wrapping around him like a boa constrictor, reaching up to his neck where it tightened. He tried to step away, but there was no room to move, none at all, and he trod on air for a moment before dropping hard. Nothing fell from his pockets. He didn't have his wallet or phone and he couldn't remember where he'd left them. He was sad about that. At least with the wallet there or the phone, one day someone might be able to figure out who he was. He heard, he actually heard the crack of his neck breaking. But the last thing he felt 
was relief from the thirst. That's the end. Thank you so much, Karen. <laughs> that was chilling. <laughs> chills really me wonderful. to think about it. What's that? It does. It chills me too. Actually, it's one of those ones that um, sort of, yeah. I thought about it as I'm on traveling on buses and seeing various people and seeing isolated areas and that sort of thing. So it does kind of chill me as well. Do, do you find that um, a theme in your fiction is sort of looking for the potential for horror in everyday, ordinary, routine experiences? So even so much that I look at it, I just find it naturally for some reason. I don't know why. I mean, I'm pretty positive in my normal outlook on life, but for some reason I do somehow see that uh, the, the, dark, the dark stuff lying underneath um, the ordinary. Yeah, and I don't know why. I think that's probably the same with a lot of horror writers and horror readers as well. They have a, a, uh, an imagination that just goes there, I guess. Yeah, yeah. and I, look, I, find, I think it's really lucky in some ways. It just makes life more interesting, doesn't it? That's true, yeah. And yeah. We'll, we'll certainly be less surprised than everyone else when the zombie apocalypse really does happen. Yes. <laughs> but um, so I, I wanted to ask you a question. I've been reading uh, recently The Gate Theory, and I have read some other uh, fiction of yours recently, and I, 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 there seems to be... Um, kind of a recurring theme with your characters where they are almost trapped by their own experience. Mm. They're sort of living in the same world as everybody else, but apart from the, the, the general world because of the, the, you know, the circumstances of their own lives and past. Uh, is that something you do consciously or am I just completely reading into things in the wrong way? <laughs> oh, no, no. I, look, I don't necessarily do it consciously, but I do find that if you're really focusing on that one character, it does, but, the world does sort of close in on them, I think, to a certain extent. So it's partly about that as well. And it's also about knowing that every single person has their own uh, secret lives that we don't necessarily know about. So just trying to explore those lives in a bit more a bit more detail as well. well that makes sense. And um, before I take questions from the chat, I just want to give you my compliments on the story, That Girl, which is in the gate theory. Um, which just was so powerful, and I thought such a brilliant reimagining of a classic urban legend. Uh, really yeah. Cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I did actually write that for Ellen Datlow's um, Haunted Legends collection, and uh, I and because I was living in Fiji at the time, and she'd asked me to try and find an urban legend of Fiji, and that was I, I asked lots of people, and they didn't really have any, but that was the one that taxi drivers told me. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, about the girl. You know, we pick up a girl and then we take her to the cemetery and by the time you get there, she's disappeared. So I found that really interesting that that was over there in Fiji as well. And that was um like local Fijians. It wasn't always, I, mean, I was asking other European people as well, but mm -hmm. I was really asking taxi drivers and that sort of thing. And that was the only one that they um, that they knew. But yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Oh, that's terrific. Yeah, it's a wonderful story. Um, so let's take some questions from the chat. I'm going to start out with an easy one from Lee Murray. Uh, Karen, how are you so <laughs> twisted and weird and also so nice? Well, uh, because I'm so nice because I'm twisted and weird, I think. Um, you know, I mean, you've all, most of you have heard my theory before that horror writers and butchers and plumbers are all the nicest people because we're dealing with all the shit and blood and nasty <laughs> stuff. We're facing it, you know, we're, we're seeing it face on. We're not running away from it. And I feel like because we're dealing with it a bit more, um, I don't know if that's my theory anyway. It's certainly my way of working through nightmares and my, you know, uh, the horrors of the world, I suppose. If I could put it onto the page and inflict it on other people, um, frees me up to be not quite so twisted and weird. <laughs> Mind you, my kids would not agree that I'm not weird, but that's okay. <laughs> I think that's a, a good thing. <laughs> I think yeah. it's a good thing. Yeah. Uh, question from Teal James, Glenn. What woman writer influenced you most? I actually wrote this down because you'd ask everybody else that. So it's a really <laughs> such a good question. Yeah, and as the others have said, there's so many that I could name. But the two, I guess Daphne du Maurier is definitely uh, very early on an influence just for her. I guess she writes almost domestic horror as well, I would say, um, depicting ordinary lives but terrible things happening within that ordinary lives and just the way she really made you believe in her her people and gave me nightmares anyway. And Lisa Tuttle too. I was reading Lisa Tuttle's short stories from uh, very early on and just being inspired by the, the bravery of her putting words onto the page. Um, she's not 
she never she never bulks she never holds back and writes in such a individual and amazing way so that's just two of the many i could name great and we have a question from jonathan lees Oops, Hi, I, there we go what characteristics of ramsey's writing in dark companions did you want to echo that's yeah that's a really good question definitely something that i thought about um as i was starting to work on it so i think that i wanted to try it i think that um ramsey's work is often quite dreamlike um so i wanted to capture that sense of walking through a dream um which is why there was a lot of that wandering through you know i don't know if everybody else has had dreams like that but i often had dreams or i'm going through people's backyards and walking through houses to try and get somewhere so i was trying to capture that and then he's also got um a, a, the wither itself uh, that echoes a story he wrote called Heathrow. I think it's called Heathrow. Mm. I can't remember. Anyway, Heathrow is like the the final line, and it fills up the whole story. So that was the second second thing that I wanted to echo. Oh, very cool. Yeah. All right. I think we have another question from Carla. Uh, you have written so much. Have you ever written any humorous horror? <laughs> oh, that's another good question. I do find that there's a, a little element of. Uh, humour in almost everything I do, like little twists of little little twists. Like even in that story, there's probably little moments of, you know, the, the interactions between the bus drivers and that sort of thing. So I try to have little lighter moments. Um, but I haven't any, I've never written anything that is a humorous story, but I definitely have elements of humour. I think it's really important to, to let the horror go for a bit and have a laugh and release those tensions. Otherwise, you become immune to it, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, another question, where can uh, readers find Wither? Which book is that available? Uh, so it's called Darker, oh, you may not be able to see it, I'm not sure. Darker Companions, the oh. PS Publishing. Yeah. It's a few years old now, but it's a, such a good book and there's some really, really great stories in there. Um, yes. So that's the only place it is. Um, I'm actually hoping that this is like a little bit of a secret, but I'm just um, sent it off mm. to a filmmaker who said he wants to do uh, once wanted to know what I had available for stories um, to possible translate to the film, and I think I actually think that'd be a really good thing to to translate, especially when you get to the end and there's all those bodies hanging. Out. It's, so good. it's very <laughs> visual. Yeah. So yeah, yeah it, nothing may come of it, but um, yeah, it'd be, I think it'd be. I think it really would be quite cool. And then yeah. there probably would be a bit more humour going back to the Carla's question. I think there'd be lots of room for the banter and all that sort of stuff in there. Well, we'll all certainly keep our fingers crossed that uh, it goes somewhere. Yes, I yeah. Think it'd be awesome to see that on the silver screen. <laughs> I'll let you know. Keep you posted. And then uh, we have another question. And this one is from Alan Datlow, who is uh, pointing out Hi. that I missed one of Teal's questions. <laughs> Thank oh. you, Alan. <laughs> and it's a good question. So I'm glad she brought it back up. How, how has where you live affected your writing? Yeah, well, very much. So the story, of course, that girl that you brought up, James, um, obviously was hugely inspired by where I lived in Fiji. So we lived up on a hill and across the road from us was this very old mental asylum. Um, they still called it a mental asylum. And next door was a cemetery. So I kind of lived surrounded by these elements of this story. Um, and just the lushness, like a lot of what I describe in there were small elements that I really did witness and the smells and very, very different from um, Canberra, which is a very dry heat and not very lush at all mm. uh, and then yeah no definitely and even all my travels when I've traveled to the states I've certainly been influenced by the train trips from um, you know New York to Washington and those sorts of things like yeah so always always wanting to absorbing what's around me and, and trying to well not even trying to just by nature and I'm still using parts from when I grew, I grew up in Melbourne and, and I'm still using little elements of uh, Melbourne I guess in my stories as well that pop up every now and then yeah, and then obviously Canberra, with the stories like that one I just read and, yeah. Um, I think you just have to make the most of where you are too. Like, you know, you may not be living in the most exciting place, but everywhere around you um, are interesting things if you look look deeply enough. Yes. Well, it's, yeah. it's, that sort of circles back to uh, some of what Nicole was saying earlier about uh, New Mexico and how yeah. the, the area really so deeply influenced her writing and her interests. So. Yes, no, absolutely. Yeah, the, and but and which is great when you have got that, but also if you're stuck sort of in stuck in place, you have to try and look with a magnifying glass at what's around you and try and find some some details locally, I guess. Yes. That's what I'm saying. So, yeah. But yes, exactly. it's definitely much more, it's, it's lots of fun to travel um and be inspired by what's around you. 
yeah even if it's just around the block these days <laughs> yeah yes <laughs> so. well seeing what's left out you know i don't know what what people do elsewhere but here um if people don't want a piece of furniture or whatever they'll put it out on the curb and you can just pick it up and take it home with you and that can be really fun to just see what people have put out and you see whole lives sometimes just dumped out on the curb or they're just one single item or you know that's even that is quite a fascinating thing yes i agree and a very good Definitely. source very good source for uh furniture sometimes yeah you can find inspiration in that yes so. Terrific. Well, Karen, thank you so much. And thank you for joining us uh, from so far away and from the future, technically, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> at least for, for those of us in the state. Uh, I think thank we're going to bring back the uh, all of the readers now. And let me bring Carol in first. Hi, Carol. So much fun to hear everybody read these stories. What a great job everyone did. You guys I agree awesome. completely. Yeah, thank you so much for, for wonderful readings and for sharing such great stories with us tonight. Yeah, I, I I don't know if if everybody the readers have were able to see the comments going by, but everybody's like, wow, every single story. <laughs> you know, it, it's so much fun to see people interacting. This is this is a great thing to do, even though we can't get together in person. I'm glad we can do this and at least chat a little bit with each other and with the people in the audience. So uh, it's really terrific. So thank you both for hosting, doing all this. Yeah, seriously, thank you. Oh sure, our, our pleasure. We're uh, we're having a lot of fun doing this. Uh, it's a little bit by the seat of our pants every month, but uh, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a good time. So, um, so I think you know we're definitely interested, and I suspect our listeners are interested uh, in what you guys have coming up next. So let's uh, maybe circle back to Megan, and if if you have any new projects or things to to talk about, give us a little bit of a hint. Um, I actually recently had a story acceptance. Um, it um, The story is called Because You're Mine, and it was accepted by uh, Christine Peterson Schoonover over at um, 34 Orchard, uh, which is an online magazine, and um, it should be coming out in April, the end of April. Ooh. So that's, that's yeah, that's <laughs> it's, there's been a dry spell, so that's for me, that was kind of exciting to uh, have that happen. And then also, um, I have a story over on Brian King's um, Patreon. He's um, celebrating women in horror by um, highlighting women. I think it's like Friday, Saturday, Sunday, he's doing like one woman each day and putting a story of theirs on his Patreon. So if, if that's something you're interested in, you can go over there. I know that um, he's had Linda Addison on there and Haley Piper and a few other women at this point. So hopefully by the end of the month, he'll have a big collection over there. Oh, that's so cool. Well, congrats on the uh, the sale. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Terrific. Terrific. And Nicole, what do you have coming up? So I just released the new novella last month called A Theft Most Foul. It's the second mm -hmm. novella in my Kingdom of Avis mystery series um, where the it's I have a female protagonist who's an investigator, but she's a hawk and she has the ability to see the unseen which allows her to investigate crimes in this fantasy kingdom of Avis where everyone are, is bird-like or divided into bird-like castes. So that's, that's what so I just cool. released. That's super <laughs> cool. <laughs> well, then, can, you, can you repeat the name, please? Yeah, it's called A Theft Most Foul, uh, as in bird, F-O-W-L. <laughs> that's what, oh, that's what two, cool, cool. but one is called Kill Three Birds. Um, nah. and so... <laughs> So yeah, each um, novella follows Prentice, who was an investigative hawk around the kingdom of Avis as she investigates uh, crimes. Awesome. Oh, that's so cool. You know, that's and that's nice. just as fascinating. We talk about point of view as writers, but that's a pretty interesting point of view for the investigator, you know? It gives you a really different way to look at things, huh? Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Any, any uh, anthologies in your future that you might edit again? <laughs> <laughs> Always one enough. In your, in your spare time. Actually, we just released, uh, Mocha Memoirs just released Slice Girls, which is a charity anthology of them mm -hmm. not see horror. So if you guys want to check that out, all proceeds go to Benefit Planned uh, Parenthood. That's a great title, too. Uh, it's edited by Camilla Voice, so I didn't edit that one. But yeah, Mocha Memoirs tries to produce an anthology for Women in Horror Month every two years. Oh, that's great. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And Nancy, what's on your uh, your horizon? 
Um, I um, I have a short story coming out in 99 Tiny Terrors, um, which is being edited by Jennifer Brozek. Um, I don't know when, but um, it's uh, actually the story I read it our last reading at KGB. Um, it's a nature horror, I guess. So that's how I categorize it. Cool. Is that the one from your uh, Fire Island residency? It is one of the ones, yes, from the Fire okay. Island residency, which, boy, have I thought about that a lot. <laughs> Just cabin to myself. <laughs> I was going to say, yes. like being isolated wow. was, was a choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I like lots of like ocean air, too, which is no people around. It was good. <laughs> yes. Karen, what do you have coming up? Um, I've got a few things, but one of them I've got um, hopefully this year is my novella with um, Cemetery Dance, which is called called Bitters, and it's about a very, very enormous Iron Man where this town dumps all their bodies into the Iron Man and the bitters are what comes out of his toe eventually. They've got a little tap on his toe and you drink the bitters. Oh. So it's, yeah, everyone's going, wow! That sounds <laughs> um, and wonderful. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I'm hoping that's out this year. We've, we've been working on it for quite a while, and, I'm, and hopefully that one's going to come out this year. So called Bitters. Terrific. And I, I know Thank recently you, you um, did a book with Ellen Datlow. Oh, uh, yeah, Ellen. Ellen sorry, I forgot. It's so cool. Yes, yeah, so that's called Tool Tales and from IFWG. And that was Ellen's um, photos of her bizarre and amazing tool collection. And I wrote just little mini stories for each one without knowing what the tools were. So she'd put up a picture of the tool and I would just use my crazy weird imagination and write a story about them and then we'd figure out what the tool was. So yeah, Jerry Huntman at um, IFWG has put that out into a really cool little chat book, which is gorgeous. We love it. Oh, yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Did you get to find out after the fact what the tools actually yeah, were? Yeah, well <laughs> um, Ellen would post on Facebook and we'd try to figure out, you know, people would give us advice or we, we figured out I think all of them. <laughs> okay. Yes. Some of them they're still they're still up for up for grabs. If you want to get the book and send us a message to tell us what they are, we will give you a prize of some kind. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a challenge. Wait me on. <laughs> yeah, that one's really cool. Thanks for reminding me of that. Sorry, I forgot. Oh, that's so clever. That That's like when you go to a convention and they do a thing where they put up slides as if it's a normal presentation and you just have to talk through it as if you know what's going on. That's so yeah. much fun. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's, yeah, it's, it was it was really, really fun. And just tapping in, I was having a bit of a dry school writing at that time and so it really just clicked, made something click. I don't know if you guys have all had that. When you're stuck on something and you use some weird little writing prompt and it just turns it, turns it all back on again. It just, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, Jim, how about you? Do you have something new coming up or what's your most recent thing you want to tell us about? What's what's up? Uh, yes, I, ha I will have a few things uh, coming up this year that haven't quite been announced yet. Um, so the one I can talk about is that whenever the next issue of Cemetery Dance uh, hits newsstands and mailboxes, uh, I will have a story in that called Great. Day of Listening. Good. So I'm Excellent. looking forward to that. Excellent. Fantastic. Cool. cool, cool, cool. And Carol, what do you have coming up? I'm very excited to, uh, we just announced yesterday, the, the new anthology edited by April Gray is called Hell's Malls, Sinister Shops, Cursed Objects, and Maddening Crowds. And uh, that's available for pre-order. There it is, just in time for Valentine's Day if you want your creepy office. Uh, it, it releases tomorrow in ebook and it's gonna come out in a print book in, in a few more weeks and stuff. So we'll actually be talking about that when we do that reading at, uh, at the SAS at Public Library. I'm sure we'll be talking about that because, uh, you know, it's a, a number of quite a number of HWA New York members are in that, so that's one of the things mm -hmm. we'll want to talk about there. Um, and you know, I mentioned all those uh, all those events up at the beginning. I'm going to put those in. I, I tried to put them in the chat, and it's just too hard to do it that way because there's too many words. So what I'm going to do when this comes out on YouTube, I'll put them in the uh, uh, the comments after YouTube, and I'll go put them in Facebook after the event's over, so we'll be able to get all those. Oh, great! Cool. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. And then I know, I, I can't remember if we put the cover up. I know we talked about Nicole's anthology, Slay, so I'm just going to show off Please that. Please do, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Love that. <laughs> That's so cool. So That's good. So cool. I was delighted to be part of the fundraiser for that, and it's just such a really cool uh, anthology. You know, it's very cool. Thank you. Awesome. So do, do, do any of you have questions for each other or comments or anything you'd like to say before we uh, we conclude the program? 
just just impressed by everybody. Thank you right. so much. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's great. All right. So for those of you in our audience, uh, please consider if you're watching us on YouTube, uh, click subscribe so you can uh, follow updates for future sessions in Galactic Terrors. Uh, we are really working hard to uh, reach as many people as we can. So if you're interested and you've enjoyed this, check it out. And also, I, I strongly recommend that uh, you know you go ahead and check out some of the books by our readers tonight. Uh, their websites are all up in the chat, and I'm sure they'd be really excited uh, if you went out and picked up one of their books and uh, gave it a read. I guarantee that it will be a good read, uh, whoever's book you pick up, or pick up one from everybody. <laughs> Uh, we also uh, have the Galactic Terrors newsletter, and you can sign up for that at the link on the screen. And I think, Carol, maybe you can put that in the chat before we wrap yep. up for tonight. There our it next is. reading will be March 11th. Uh, we do our readings on the second Thursday of every month. And if you'd like more information about the HWA or the New York chapter, feel free to check out our website, hwany.org. Yeah. All right. And, and one of the best comments I've just seen, uh, several folks have said in the chat, I've picked up books already tonight. So, oh, yeah. terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, everybody. Yeah. I think that's one of my favorite things about readings in general, whether they're online or in person, is the opportunity for authors to connect with new readers. And that's just mm. priceless. Oh, yeah. So. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Very much fun. Well, Great. I'm well, so thanks. glad y'all joined us. And yeah, oh, go ahead, Carol. I was just, I was just saying, I, I'm so glad y'all have joined us, and I look forward to having you back again at some point in the future because you know this is so much fun to do, and without readers and and folks like you, we would just be sitting here talking to each other, and I don't think so many people would tune in, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well. Thank you all. Uh, thanks to everybody in our audience. And we hope to see you again in March. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep reading. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.